Hello, it's Alonzo of the Goddess. Again, the Capital Mantos, once again, helping you with your environment and Virathon uh, preparation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about natural resource management very quickly. Um, there are lots of different kinds of nat management techniques. Here is a common one that's used for meadow management, and that is uh, basically controlled burns. They're not just they set the thing on fire, but they're controlled. You can actually see here, for example, um, here is a, a staff person dressed, you know, he's already uh, built for this. He, he's actually cleared a fire line around it so the thing doesn't spread. He's ready to tamp anything out that goes in other areas. It's a control burn and that's important because it removes the thatch that makes it easier for native animals to, to basically travel from one place to an area. It also increases the amount of food because sometimes that fresh new area with less competition um, leads to there being a lot more food for them. Uh, it increases the nutritional value of some kinds of food. It reduces the base of species because most of those did not m did not uh, come from areas where there was burning and so that really re helps that. And also, many plants need light in order for them to germinate, so it does help with that too. And again, edge habitats are very important. It, it, it combines a different kind of habitat that, collect, that helps lots of different kinds of animals. So that's why meadows can be very, very important. And unfortunately, in our area, we have much less meadows than we have forests, so it's very much uh, a habitat we don't have much of. Now, something else I'm thinking about is something called the biological uh, and the cultural caring capacity of something. This is how much the land can support. The biological carrying capacity is how much a, a certain area can support in wildlife because if there's any more of them, they've, they've they exceeded the capacity and they're destroying their very own habitat. Now, that's different from a cultural carrying capacity. That is what people accept as being the right kind, the right kinds of animals out there. So if um, you, you'll oftentimes you reach a biological care capacity where the habitat can't support anymore way before you reach the culture carrying capacity when people start complaining about animals and things like that and what kinds of damage they do. So um, biological care capacity is really what we need to worry about because it's going to happen way before people notice that the destruction of the habitat is taking place. So we're very lucky. I mean, we have four major, um, you know, flyways. Okay, you can see here the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Mississippi, and the Central. And we sit right along the Atlantic Flyway, which is, you know, it, it, it's incredible. It's a great piece of area. It comes all the way up to the mountains, and much of the wildlife comes through here. It's quite important for all sorts of waterfowl, all sorts of shorebirds, and things like that to travel up and forth, back and forth, as well as warblers and whatever. Um, and but it's also incredibly um, fertile lands, and because of that. Uh, almost a third of the nation's, popula uh, the, the nation's populations live there, so everybody wants to live in this one area. But we have other ones as well, the Pacific, which travels right along there and stretches all the way down to South America, the Mississippi, which follows the river, and the Central, which makes up about, you know, uh, more than half of the land's capacity, and it's a special type of area and lots of things fly through there. So another thing to discuss is basically the different ha uh, the different habits of animals. So here's a different kind. Here's a way of thinking of it. One is diurnal. Diurnal animals, those are things that come out in the daylight, like things like butterflies. They fly during the day, and so di diurnal means day. They are most active during the day, which is exact opposite of nocturnal. Nocturnal meaning night. They actually come out. They're adapted for coming out at night. Many of them, like this flying squirrel, have large eyes. They have big whiskers to feel around. Um, they, these are animals again that are adapted to coming out at the very uh, at the latest when there is no light around. That's when they do their best. So they, diurnal daytime, nocturnal nighttime, and then we have crepuscular animals. Crepuscular animals are those things that come out right as it's getting dark or getting light, and it's during that magic hour, or as a, sometimes a little bit more that these animals are most active. And many animals are like that. That's originally what deer used to do and things like that. They're crepuscular animals. They come out when the light is either coming into place or disappearing, and that is when they're most active. So another thing to think about is the idea of what things animals eat. So it's not always the strictest, but let's go over it a little bit. So a carnivore, carne meaning meat, they eat meat. And there's lots of different kinds of carnivores. Carnivores, again, things that eat meat. And within carnivores, there's also other designations. So for example, inside carnivores, there is a certain group that just eat fish. Those are called pescivores because they eat just pests, which means fish. So that is one example uh, of, uh, you know, just one example of one type of carnivore. Now we have a herbivore, things that eat, um, you know, plants. And within there, you also get other definitions of it. So herbivores eat plants, but there's other things too, like frugivores eat fruit. And frugivores then are animals that actually, uh, that feed just on fruit um, as opposed to just any other kind of plant. 
And then a lot of the large group omnivores. These are things that can eat most different things. Some might prefer more meat than, than plants, but they can survive off of both of them. Omnivores, meaning they'll eat both plants and animals, and that is a, 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 a one definition of an omnivore. So just about the diversity that we have, we have a lot of different kinds of diversity all over there. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So there are 121 mammals, more or less. And I remember that scientists argue about this. Some people lump them all together and simply split them apart in different things. But approximately 121 animals all over East and North America. Of these, Virginia has 85 very rich, rich examples of a lot of different kinds of mammals who are very rich in mammal life. We're also quite rich in bird life. So there's about 473 bird species that have been recorded, actually more than that in Virginia. 90 of these are rare animals that sometimes come through and sometimes don't, you know? It's something that, uh, that, that strays in on some years, but not very many of them, and do doesn't come in at all during other years, like snowy owls. They come in from the north, and we see them every once in a while, but they're not very common in Virginia. And then we have 91 to call accidentals. These are things that come through, but by accident. They got lost and aren't supposed to be there. And every year we get a few. Right now, for example, um, there, is, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is one uh, waterfowl now that people are looking at, and, and it's basically a goose from a Greenland, and it is now in, in the Potomac area. But again, it's an animal that accidentally got through here. It was supposed to be in Greenland and ended up over here, okay? So that's an accidental. There's also one in Fairfax right now. So for example, there's a rufous hummingbird, a western hummingbird, that accidentally got its way over here is now surviving. So those are accidentals. They got here by accident. And again, you can see the, the different kinds of them, 46 different kinds of waterfowl species. Many of them migrate through here, but are quite common in the wintertime. Um, nine different kinds of woodpeckers, each with their own special kinds of habitat. A ton of different kinds of perching birds and 17 hawk species. So all of these kind of makes up some of the wonderful diversity we have here in Virginia. So we also have a lot of different kinds of frogs. And you'll notice here, we have more frogs in Maryland because of the different kinds of habits that we have. Some of the most common frogs are the green frogs. Those are the ones that jump and you hear the Wah! as they jump into the water. Then the biggest frog we have are the bullfrogs. They can get a couple of pounds and are much, much bigger. Then we have a couple of spotted frogs, the pickerel frog or that likes to, uh, likes to move along, especially on streams and things like that. It's a smaller uh, frog that has squared stripes, uh, squared spots on his back as opposed to round ones, and they're usually in straight lines. That makes up a pickerel frog. And then the southern leopard frog, which are round spots spattered to its back, sometimes called a, a southern leopard frog, sometimes called a coastal plains leopard frog. But regardless, it is a spotted frog that we have around here. And then finally, some that live in different areas, like the wood frog lives in the woods. And so uh, it, has a, it has a mask on him. That is the way to identify it, a neat little kind of, of frog that we have. And again, Virginia is much richer in frog species than Maryland is. And you can also say that as well for common turtles. We have 25 turtles, and Maryland has 20. We both shared the same kinds of sea turtles, but that we have other ones too. The most common kind of, of, of land turtle we have is the woodland box turtle. Some people call it eastern box turtle. Now it's called woodland box turtle. It closes up like a box. The, the, bottom, pa the, the bottom part of it, the plastron can, can seal quite uh, effectively against the top. And they're different when they're young, but again, that is the most common land turtle we have and really the only one we have in throughout most of Virginia. But we have other things too. The largest is the snapping turtle. Uh, it can get up to 68 pounds, a very large type of animal. The most common is the eastern painted turtle, which has, which has again, the little eye spot behind its back and, it's, and the, the sutures, the, the, the um, scales along its back all line up. That is a, me, a medium sized, very common pond turtle. And we have some introduced ones too. The red-eared slider is introduced. It's a Midwestern type of things, and it comes through, and it unfortunately um, does mate with other things. So here we have a red-eared slider, and here is an integrated ma mated, unfortunately, with one of our native turtles. And again, it um, that is one of the problems with something in base that they do they do interfere with the, the ecology. It's here, but again, we're quite rich in wildlife, and it's something I wanted to point out. So we also have a ton of com of of, uh, of of snakes. So again, Virginia has 34 as, com as compared to Maryland's 28. The most common one we have, the eastern, uh, what's, what's called the northern brown snake. Now it's called, um, you know, the decays brown snake. They changed the name of it. We have the eastern rat snake, what people used to call the black rat snake. It's the largest snake that we have. The black racer that looks a lot like it, but is it would, but is much thinner and doesn't like to climb trees and so forth. The northern water snake, often mistaken for a venomous snake, but is not the most common water snake we have. This is what the juvenile rat snake looks like. It turns into that. This is what juvenile racer looks like, and it turns into that. So again, we're quite rich in different kinds of snakes, and these are the most common ones that we have. 
So again, folks, I invite you um, to, to, to follow me on, on the Capital Naturals. And again, I wish you luck on Envirothon.